gonna, I'm gonna play in the big leagues. I wanna be in the toughest, fiercest uh, environment that will bring out the best version of myself. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Informed Citizen Podcast, where we talk to people who are changing the world so that you can learn how to do that too. This show is for the game changers, the world shapers, the inquisitive and the ambitious who believe in Thomas Jefferson's great saying that an informed citizenry is at the heart of a dynamic democracy. I am Philip Lindholm, and I'm very thankful to be joined today for our inaugural episode by a former Olympic athlete and founder of Robinson & Co Investment Bank, Byron Robinson. Born in Chesapeake, Virginia, Byron is renowned for his exceptional achievements in finance, sports, real estate, and entrepreneurship. As a former world-class athlete, Byron competed in the Olympic Games and the 400-meter hurdles and holds a personal record of 48.58 seconds for the event, just a little bit faster than me. He has since transitioned from the athletic arena to the world of business, serving as the CEO of Robinson & Co Banking, which specializes in transactions ranging from one to $100 million. In addition to his professional pursuits, Byron embraces an active lifestyle that includes hiking, jujitsu, surfing, and running marathons. He's also learning to play piano. So Byron, my first question is, is there anything you don't do? <laughs> um, well, I feel like I don't do it enough. By the way, thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for coming. You know, as you were giving that intro, I felt like you weren't talking about me. Because uh, I always feel like there's more that I could be doing. But uh, no, there's a, a laundry list of things I still want to check off. I mean, I feel like I'm just getting started, to be quite honest with you. Um, I mean, you, you should talk to my parents because every time I talk to them, I mean, I'm mean, i laying out like just a book of things that I have not done yet. I suspect you're going to say that same thing to me when you're 50. Probably so. And at 60 and at 70. Well, I think it's really important for people to know. I don't know that they can appreciate where you're going if they don't know where you've come from. And I only know a little bit about your backstory, but I know that there was a time where you were living in hotels, but you found your home on the track. So I want to know, what did it feel like to go on the track and run? That's hard to put into words, to be quite honest with you. Um, it was my home. It was my safe haven. It was a place where I can just unleash and just let it all out. Um, I still find that in spaces, like still today, which is why... I, I'm actively still doing physical things. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to go so far as to say that is my God because I'm a Christian man. But um, it's the closest thing to it, you know, because mm -hmm. you, you can just go out there and just be one with the world and just forget about everything else. Because if you think about it, especially in the business world, you don't really have uh, that much, if any time, just to yourself, like just to, just to think. Most people don't even think. Mm -hmm. They don't just sit down and just think with no auditory uh, distractions. They don't think. And, uh, you know, starting from a child, uh, I use track as a way to just think and learn so much about myself, uh, even till today, which is why I'm still, I still work out as if I'm getting ready for <laughs> the Navy SEALs. What did you learn about yourself when you were on the track? Uh, I'm incredibly resilient, at least by my standards. Uh, and that I can make it happen. Like I can I can push forward. And I learned a skill by compounding wins over inches over the days and the minutes and the seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause when, you, when you're out there in a the track, it's you against yourself. There's, there's my, my high school coach, Claude Takini uh, would always say that, and it kind of, it, it rings through my head. Like even to this day, there's no defense in track and field. Like there's no boogeyman that's gonna come and, you know, hold you back. If, if you're not successful in track, it's cause you didn't, you didn't do the work. Uh, and I learned that I can rely on myself because I can work hard. And that will always get you through? Always, to this day. The lessons that I learned from track still carry through to this day, even in high finance. Because like, that's the way I have to work. I have to break it down to a very rudimentary level mm -hmm. uh, that I learned in track. And yeah, you know, you know, I will go so far as to say if I didn't run track, I wouldn't be here today, to be quite honest with you. Not in the same way, right? Like, I suspect you're the kind of guy where if it wasn't track, it might have been something else. Yes, yes, uh, yes, in space. I mean, you're good. Because I don't like to highlight that part because uh, whenever I'm talking to younger people, I don't, I don't want them to, to look at me 
like I'm a guy that was just born with uh with skills. I, I was born with skills specific to myself, but not with any objective objectively better skills than what they have uh subjectively to themselves, you know. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I would have to agree with that. Yeah, I, I mean, I would be doing something. And yet I suspect you have all these things you can bring to the world, to a problem. And this, wor- this show is very much about people who are trying to solve problems in the world. What problem is it that you're trying to solve? Because you can go out there and solve any number of things. Yeah. But I suspect you've chosen something. And I want to yeah. know what you chose and why. I chose the hardest one, uh, being capitalism and entrepreneurship. Because uh, unless... Let's talk about it. To my knowledge, capitalism is the number one thing that has brought the most people out of poverty. Uh, so it's something that we have to enrich and kind of bring out of of the world. I mean, you can point at literally any problem short of possibly religion that cannot be cured with pure capitalism. So I've built my entire uh, ego my whole persona, my my everything, uh, around enriching and furthering capitalism. But wait a minute! I thought capitalism was the thing that uh, has its thumb on you. It doesn't allow people to, <laughs> to to break the system, to get past the system. The system is against you. I've never believed that. I, I don't believe in. I don't believe in any thought that makes me feel weak, like just across the board. Um, and this is just objectively not true. Have you ever felt weak? There have been times where I have felt weaker, but I would never uh, submit, admit, or anything closely related to ever feeling weak. So capitalism is something that has empowered you. You see it's empowered others. How is it a problem that you're trying to fix? Yeah, because the the form of cap, well, one, not enough people believe in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are too many people who subscribe to the ideology of being weak. Uh, they don't, they think you have to be BlackRock to be a capitalist. Or Walmart or uh, Amazon, you know, any Fortune 500 company Mm -hmm. to be capitalism, which is interesting to me because this country wasn't built. I mean, that's a recent phenomenon, like these Mm -hmm. these mega uh, conglomerates, really. Uh, This country was built on like that mom and pop trade, like just simple bartering, you know, fruit for coins and then using the coins to to buy clothing and, you know, or um, tradesmithing or, you know, anything of that sort. Uh, and you see it a lot because with my parents had a pop up uh, over the weekend. Cause my my parents have a uh, a vegan treat brand, which everyone loves, by the way. And the chocolate delights. Go ahead and plug it. What's yeah, the name? <laughs> uh, Simply amazing treats. And but it's those type of companies, you know, with that really personal relationship that this country was actually built on. Uh, uh, again, these mega conglomerates are a recent phenomenon. Uh, you don't have to be that to be engaged in in capitalism. Like at all. In fact, most likely, even if you try, pray, put everything into it, it's probably not going to happen, even if you wanted it to. So you might as well embrace the other end of capitalism of just providing value at a, at a smaller scale, more impactful, but at a smaller scale. So the biggest problem with capitalism is that people don't believe in it. Correct. Correct. And I think that leads into your company. How does your company address capitalism? How does it help yeah, spread so- that message? Yeah, the way that we go about doing it is providing money to capitalists. So, so these entrepreneurs, our, our entire company is built around being the conduit to entrepreneurship. Because entrepreneurship, a lot like athletics, actually it's one to one. So, part of the reason why I got into entrepreneurship is because it's gritty, it's lonely. Uh, you have to have a high, uh, an incredibly high risk tolerance. You have to have a vision, a game plan. You have to be consistent, disciplined, uh, all of which, you know, feeds over directly into business. Um, so our, our entire stilo is to back the people who embrace those qualities, uh, more specifically by providing money to them, whether it's on the debt or the equity side. So we position ourselves to these people as your one-stop shop for money, period, no matter what it is that you need, no matter the amount. Now we advertise between one to a hundred, but we comfortably have deals over a hundred, and we take on clients time to time that that are beneath the one million mark. But they have to have like a, a plan to go back to you know the similarities with with athletics uh, for their company actually to grow. You have to be ambitious. What if the plan is to stay small? Is bigger always better? Uh, you know, I, I don't like to to 
say good or bad, uh, you know, better, best, anything like that, because it comes down to personal preference. Everybody has a different situation, and I'm very biased on the topic, admittedly. I want to be the biggest thing out there. I, I mean, I, I want to be the next Alexander the Great, minus the slaughtering. <laughs> So it's a key caveat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with, with that one caveat. Well, so let's stop there for a second. Alexander had Aristotle as his tutor. Who are, who do you look up to? Who do you learn from? Look up to is a very interesting phrase because uh, we I think naturally as humans, like you kind of look up to people. Uh, but as a Christian, I know I, you're not supposed to look up to other men. Um, there are multiple people that. I actually literally have a list. It's like a list of, I think this is 46 people now, maybe 47, of people who have traits uh, in, in some capacity that I want to embody more in myself. Uh, and that can range anything from, um, believe it or not, David Blaine to Mike Tyson to Jamie Dimon to my dad. Like, so it's, it's a very What trait diverse. of Mike Tyson do you want to emulate? I love Mike Tyson fearlessness. He is a he's a fearless man. Mm -hmm. He I have a a natural proclivity uh, towards uh, people who are fearless, which is why I brought up Alexander the Great. Mm -hmm. Can we touch on him real quick? By the Let's way, do it. As a boy, as a boy, he almost ruled the known world. Like in that time, um, he got very little sleep. He was a drunk. Most people didn't know that he, he was a drunk. I mean, his diet consisted of maybe like beer, water, and like bread. He got very little sleep. He was very well taught. He was a hard worker. He worked like pretty much throughout all nights. And the guy just would not stop for anything. I mean, there are accounts of him being in battle where he's no Napoleon, by the way, where Napoleon had a lot of those traits minus the physicality of it. He wasn't a, like a towering guy. Napoleon uh, was a... He was a military genius. He was a very tactical, a tactical person. He was a voracious reader. We know about his love life. Um, so he, you know, they, they share some similarities, but he was no Napoleon as far as his, his uh, military acumen, at least from everything that I've read. But see, those two are interesting, right? Because in some way, one could argue that Napoleon's life ended, his career ended because his ego got too big. Yeah. Where's the danger there? How, how, how big is too big when it comes to the ego? Here's the thing. You kind of never know until it's too late because you, you have to have if you are a person that want to take on these kind of goals uh, like like they did or like business leaders want to do today. You got to have a big ego. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it just comes with it. Mm -hmm. But you have to have a way to check it at the right times. Finding out when those right times are. Virtually impossible. Now, I go about it by. Because everything that I do say and think is is grounded in my Christianity. So, at, I mean, I pray first thing in the morning, last thing at night. Uh, I read the Bible every day. Now, I'm, I'm no Bible thumper. I, I can't recount, you know, uh, countless verses to you. But the messaging is there in my spirit. So that's, that's the way that I attempt of going about it. But I don't think there is an answer to it. Um, I mean, I can say, like, have a counsel have a, a personal board of advisors, you know, uh, a significant other that, you know, that is really a partner in there with you, mm -hmm. uh, a conciliar of some sorts. But even then, all of these people don't have what you have. And you know that if you're the one, you know, tackling these big goals. So I, I think it's the good. I think it's the bad that comes with the good. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a double edged sword. Uh, and unfortunately, you never really know until you're too late, like, like Napoleon outcast it on some island. Uh, sick and withered uh, on his deathbed and then finally admitting he went too far. How can you attack big things? You know, let's, okay. I'm Susie. Uh, I'm down in bed. Life is hard. You know, I got long list of things that are working against me. Okay. How can I become a multimillionaire and I can't even afford my phone bill? Okay, Susie, this is what you do. First, you have to get out a book. I tell people this, by the way. They never believe me. You get out a physical book. You, you, you write out a five-year plan, like a bullet list of things that you want to uh, either have or achieve five years from now. 
you reverse engineer it to this year and you start with today. Now I can tell you what I do. I didn't create this by the way. Uh, I practice it religiously. I do this every single day, including Sundays. I do not miss a day. I don't miss a day. I don't miss a day. Do you miss a day? I do not miss a day. Okay. I literally only do five things every day that moves the ball forward inch by inch by inch on a daily basis. And once I get those five things done, or if I don't, uh, I either write down a W or an L for the day. Um, so that way you can you can flip through the year and tangibly you can rate your year, like you can give it a number grade, uh, like you're in school, on how you perform for the year. Uh, for instance, this year I think I'm gonna be at I'm projected to finish at around 94. Uh, percent But what Susie needs to do is to keep that long term in mind, know where she wants to end up, but take care of today. It, it's a almost a branch, an offshoot of the make your bed theory. Like you need to take care of what's in front of you right now. Uh, and Susie also needs to realize that like, you know, wins and success compounds, like the more you do something, the easier it is to do. Like you, you compound in certain directions and you control what direction you're going to compound toward literally today, like literally today, you can start at 10 o'clock at night and get it done by 11 and get your win. It's not like some thing where, you know, you're slaving throughout the day and you're, you know, there's some days that are going to run long, of course, but like, as you keep doing it. It gets easier and then you look up you can help but to win mm-hmm. and you get to a point where you're like it's the same way if you're losing like because Susie's probably <laughs> this fictional character Susie's probably uh, saying like why do I keep losing why does everything keep working against me well it's because you have that compound system working against you you're not taking control of it and, and putting it into your favor you, you have to make it your slave not the other way around if somebody wants to make a big impact in their community, if they want to make their community better, if they want to make their society better, I'm hearing you say they have to make themselves better first. Correct. Correct. And be explicit on the result that they actually want to see. Um, when it comes, to, by the way, I'm no expert on this. Like I'm, I'm work in progress like everybody else. Well, something's working. <laughs> well, it's relative, though. I mean, there are things that I'm doing that are working by most people's standards, but it's all on a slide and scale. Um you really, really, really do have to be explicit about what it is that you want to see as an end result. That's not the, when you're writing down like your, the five-year plan or the one-year plan or whatever, whatever plan, uh, you have to be explicit about what it is you want to see. When I, when I mean explicit, how do you see the weather being that day? What type of fragrance are you going to wear? What kind of clothes are you going to wear? How's the tonation in your voice going to sound? What mood are you trying to project? What uh, expressions do you want to see on people's faces? Uh, I mean, like all of that. You, you have to see it to that level of detail uh, or else your actions are not going to actually like be aligned with what it is that you think that you want to see. Most so you're saying think, be intentional every step in every way, every day. You have to be intentional. You have to always be on, like always be on to the smallest detail to the podcast you listen to, I'll listen to a finance one on the way over here, to the podcast that you listen to, to the YouTube videos, to the to the type of mood of the conversations that you're having with just the barista at Starbucks. I mean, it all matters because you, you don't know who they know. And see, I think this is really important because we live in a society where we are drowned in information, but we're also starving for wisdom and clarity and all those things, right? So really controlling our inputs Right, not listening to just anything, listening yeah. to the thing that's gonna move the ball down the field in that inch kind of way. This show is sponsored by Terry Wise and Associates, the premier real estate firm in the Northwest who believes that expertise matters. If you're looking to buy, sell, or develop real estate and want an expert on your side, go to www.terrywisere.com or call 253-655-7385. Uh, I love classical art too, so you're gonna see a lot of classical art. Um, you're gonna see a lot of Porsches. I'm a Porsche guy. I love cars too. Uh, and you're going to see a lot of entrepreneurship, like a lot of entrepreneurially um, tailored like quotes or like news. So like Financial Times, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journal, anything like that. Um, with other people explore pages, you may see gossip pages or who who else, like who knows? I mean, it, it, I mean, these days it could literally be anything. Um, so these are the cars, right? And you and I have talked about watches in the past, the watches, 
classic art. These are things that really thrive because of capitalism. They are markers of capitalism. They are symbols. Um, when you think of capitalism, you think of the nice car. Do you think capitalism is good? You've talked about it, capitalism as being something that something that can elevate people from where they are to where they want to be. Is capitalism good for mental health? Because you've also talked about the granular way in which we have to mind our thoughts and our ideas and our inputs. Um, that can be exhausting too. And, and a lot of people are exhausted out there. Can it help with uh, your mental health? Absolutely. And almost any end of it. Um, and we could approach it like from the company end, uh, creating a company. I actually talked to a guy the other day at a, uh, at a startup event in Seattle. He wants to actually, he's incredible. He wants to do two things. He wants to create a bank just as a, as a side gig. <laughs> I'm like, that's ambitious. Sounds like your kind of people. <laughs> yeah. No, no. I love these kind of guys. Like, of course I do. Yeah. Right. Uh, but he also talked. Well, you to, are these kind of guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, I corresponded. Yeah, yeah. We, we're, we're peers. Let, let's say. Uh, so he wants to start a bank, and he wants to create an app that basically that find uh, objective ways to track your mental health and give you pointers of what you can do specific to you uh, to enhance it. So I mean, so I say all that to say this: you can approach it that way. But here's the part about capitalism, more specifically, entrepreneurship that doesn't get like spoke about a lot because you you you'll hear the bad stuff like the long nights, uh, the loneliness, and blah blah blah. We all, we all know that. We get it. We heard that story before. But you also get a sense of fulfillment that you are like putting your all into something. And at the end of the day, when you get into bed, like you know you you put a full day's work like out into the world. Like you have expressed yourself in the highest like way possible. But of course, that's not unique to capitalism. That's socialism. That could take place in many different forms, many different avenues. Why yeah. capitalism? So what makes capitalism unique versus the other, uh, let's call them co-evils, uh, is that you objectively get uh, compensated, not just in the form of money, but the market compensates you according to the value that you have uh, exhibited out into the world. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, really anything else, they try to... Uh, have a, a state approach to it. They try to allocate, you know, the response disproportionately to what you actually gave into it. Um, capitalism is fair. It's fair in the truest sense of fairness of like what it actually means. Um, you cannot dictate. Is it fair if there's not equal opportunity? And I'm just playing devil's advocate here, right? Yeah, no, please. Um, let's. But if you start in one place and I start in another, is it fair? Um, I, I think a lot of times we focus on the front end of fairness because they're focusing on their deficits, their perceived deficits, and not too much on the things that are actually advocating like in their favor. Um, you could be born with, let's say, two left feet. You're probably not running track at Texas, okay? But that same person with two left feet could be a genius in, I don't know, uh, computer science. Or, I mean, whatever. It, it could be anything. It could be bottle caps. It, it, it can literally be anything. It could be being a shoesmith, whatever. You can be world-class at that. Who's to say that their total package is objectively fair or not fair? Uh, I think the, the onus is on us to find things that we have proclivities toward and that work in our favor and to double down on that and not focus too much on, like, if the world is fair. I mean, newsflash, the world isn't fair. Nothing's fair. Like, not. Nothing's fair. Even it actually, it's actually more unfair when you try to make it fair. <laughs> and I think you and I share this in common. Actually, I think that the people that work the hardest are the people for whom it felt unfair, unfair from the beginning. Right. Like I think you and I both come, came up in places where, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't have a lot of opportunity. We didn't have mentors who showed us this is how you do well in the world. So we had to figure it out. And which so, which is unfair to the people who grew up on the other on the other end for of that sure because we had the opportunity to learn so many skills uh, that if you if you look at them as skills we had the opportunity to learn those skills that we can now like enact and exert how unfair it actually is. <laughs> it's all about persp uh, perspective and how you look at things, man. I mean, it's a classic glass half full or half empty conversation. It just depends on how you look at it. I mean, there's so many different angles that you can approach something to work in your favor 
it just come down to whether you want it to or not. Um, cause I mean, for my store specifically, I can just as easily take the other side of it and say the world did this to me. And don't get me wrong. I think I'm awesome, but I'm no Superman. Okay. So like I can easily, and I used to be that guy. I mean, as a child, there was like stints where I was poo poo pants and feeling sorry for myself. And it kind of just hit a switch like, okay, well, you know, yeah, we don't have a lot of money, but I have $2 right now. That's enough for a bag of airheads. I can get eight uh, for a dollar twenty five, sell them for twenty five cents each pocket to spread, reinvest it. Now I have lunch money, you know, so you can look at it that way or you can just say, I don't have money for lunch. And the person who didn't have that problem also didn't develop that skill to solve that problem. Exactly. So maybe privilege isn't privilege after all. No, I mean, if it, if it was, why do so many uh, kid or uh, yeah kids from uh, multi generational uh, wealthy families squander it in such a short period of time? They don't have the skills to keep it. And now this this applies not just at a family level. It, this applies to countries. Um, you can give the poorest third world country all the riches, all the gold. You can implement a central bank like in the heart of their country. And they're probably not gonna last. Still, they don't know how to keep it. Uh, I I know um, I forgot the name of the country, but Rome had had gifted one of their allies uh, back in the day. Like actually, this exact example. Like all all the all the gold, not all the gold, but a substantial amount of gold, and they just squandered it because money is not wealth. Wealth is the ability to produce goods and services efficiently. Uh, per Adam Smith. And if you don't know how to actually do that, then you're never going to be wealthy. Like It's just never going to happen because you don't have the skills. So you said money is not wealth. Is money no. power? No. Money, uh, it can be a proxy. It can, it can make it easy, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. It can make it easy to uh, obtain power, but in and of itself, it's not power. It has to work. So how can... People listening to this episode, how can Susie back in her bed, how can they fix capitalism? Which is really to say, how can they believe in capitalism in a way that makes this world a better place? Susie believes in capitalism because she probably has an iPhone. If you have an iPhone, you believe in capitalism. You, you believe in exchanging uh, uh, capital for a good or a service at a fair market value. Um, she just doesn't believe that she can participate in it. Um, and, and that's most people. They look at the game being capital, and it is a game. In fact, you should look at it like a game because it make it more fun. Um, they don't. They just don't think that they belong. It's almost they look at it like the way that a fan would look at an NBA game. They see them dunking and shooting threes and doing all these moves, and they inherently tell themselves, "Wow, they they are." They don't look at the years it took for these guys to actually get to that point the the repetitive hours in the gym the sacrifice they, they don't look at that they just they just see the end result so so because they only see the end result they think they can't participate now that's not to say that everyone can be jeff bezos or to match this uh, analogy lebron or mj or kobe like capitalism doesn't promise that it what it promises is that you can participate at the value that you stand in the marketplace um so the first thing that susie would need to do is recognize she does believe in capitalism. Like she does. If you go to the store, you believe in capitalism. She's certainly already participating in it. Whether she wants to or not. Yeah. Uh, now she just has to be on the other end of it. See herself as someone that can produce the good or service, not just consume it. Um, and it, it takes a completely different way of thinking to even get to that point. So I, I get it. And it's hard the first time that you're selling a good or service. It's hard. I remember the first time, not for the candy, but like in, in this company, actually pricing like, our service and standing on it it's it, it can be difficult but i tell you what just like with everything else it gets easier over time now i i, I would never not do it at this point because i understand my value i will pass on an opportunity if it wasn't priced accordingly to where i value myself or my company in the marketplace so it's one of those things you just got to get started and the hardest thing to do is to get started but once you take that first shot it's easier to take the the next 10. So for those people who are sitting at home imagining this business they want to start, this venture they want to start, they imagine themselves having their name on the wall the way that you have your name on the wall. 
What does it feel like to have your name on the wall? I genuinely don't stop and like think about everything, at least for me personally right now, that I have going on. Because I know the moment I do that, it's like being in the Olympics. When I, when I was competed um, in the 2016 games, I, there, was, there was not a moment where I stopped and looked around the stadium and, and was just in awe of the actual experience because I knew the moment I did that, I was done for. So what I do right now, I don't, yeah, I mean, we have some pretty incredible things going on right now. We're partnering with cities. We're working with hedge funds. Uh, we're working with middle market companies, real estate funds. Like we, there's so many like interesting uh, opportunities opening up to us. I don't stop and think about it. Actually, the route that I take to pull from uh, Alexander or Napoleon from earlier, I keep up in the ante. I keep taking big shots. I don't. I, I want to stop and think about this when I'm sixty or seventy or or older. Then I'll look back like that was a life well lived. In in the now, in the intermediate, I don't want to do that. I, I don't stop and like just think about it. I, I don't I don't look at the name on the wall or anything like that. I just keep I keep I, I keep taking bigger shots. Like right now, if, if I'm if I'm making half court shots, I'm just I'm scooting back just three more inches and keep just lobbing them up there because uh, I can't think about it. The moment I think about it, the whole the whole thing will fall apart. You remind me of other ambitious people that I've met in my life where they feel like if they do stop, other people might catch up. I think I'm the man. I know I'm the man. Um, I think God took his time with me. I think I'm one of his uh, greatest gifts, okay? With that being said, I'm dangerously insecure. I'm always, like when I'm in the gym, I'm always looking around to see who had the bigger arms. On the jiu-jitsu mat, I'm like, who, who can do their moves more smooth? In business, Okay, what, what type of moves are they making? I'm always comparing myself. I'm always not, too, at the same time. So, like, I'm comparing myself to see, like, what's, what's happening for the information. But I don't look at it in a way that that person is doing something that I can't do. I'm looking at it to see, okay, they just upped the ante. Now I know it's possible. Now I know I can go, you know, one more level past that. Um, but you kind of have to be, funny enough, you kind of have to be insecure to be confident. It, you, you kind of have to have both. Uh, you have to be, if you're a hard worker and very ambitious, you have to be insecure because you know that the state that you're in right now is not good enough. So if there's someone listening to this who wants to do better at believing in themselves, is there a single book or a single voice in the world right now that you'd say, go go listen to this person or go read this book? I'm going to say no because all they're going to do is start the cycle again of making someone, another person their God, and then they're going to see them, that person as having qualities that they don't have or can't get, I wouldn't even go, I wouldn't even approach it that way. All these like speakers, like on the, the, the interverse or any platform, they're complimentary when you already are in motion. You have to be in motion first. Then you get the tactical information from them that you can implement. But it, it truly do start with you and it really do start with doing those five things every day. You can't gain momentum unless you're moving already, right? Exactly, exactly. By the way, everything is a momentum game. Everything's a momentum game. You got to get a few wins in first. Then you're like, oh, it's like riding a bike. So there are lots of voices one can listen to in the world, but the most important voice is one's own. Yep. Yep. And God. I mean, you know, for me, praying really did change everything. Uh, I wish I, uh, I prayed consistently when I was running track. Um, I, I completely, I just fell off. I mean, there, there's no excuse. I just fell off. I just... One thing, one, it started with one day, actually the, that negative compounding effect took effect with that. Um, you'd be surprised the insight you get at night just by praying quietly to yourself, just you and God. It truly is incredible. I mean, at times it will bring you to tears, but um, it, it's, it's so much more powerful than people realize if they haven't built the habit of, of, of praying. In addition to the voice, Perhaps the thing stopping people the most is just trying to get started. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was doing karate, they talked a lot about how the hardest belt was the white belt because that was the one you had to just show up. You, walk into you door. just have to show up. Yeah. Uh, and it's really hard to gain momentum unless you're already moving. So if you're at home and you're like, gosh, I just need more mo momentum in my life. I just uh, I need a start and I'm not sure how to do it. 
Byron's dropping wise words here. He's saying, sit down with a piece of paper, with a voice or voices that are important to you, develop a plan. You may hold that plan loosely, right? That plan may change and it probably will, but the plan is the start. Yeah, the plan will change. It's, it's not even like a high likelihood. It will change. That's the nature of plans. The, your plan is like, um, it's like pointing the direction of the ship. It's not controlling the waves or the tides or your crewmen. Um, it's not even controlling the ship. All it, It's just pointing the direction of it. So what we do is a reflection of not only who we are, but who we want to be. 100%. 100%. You can't hide it. Like, it's, it's plain as day. Uh, what you have in your inside will show on the outside. Uh, from everything to how you project yourself, how do you walk, mm. how, does your, how does your body look, how's your relationships, what do people say about you? Like, you know, all these things matter. Everything matters. People think, like, it, like, just like, like what I said earlier, they, they think, like, this matters, but this don't. No, it, it all matters. It all matters because that's your brand. The way you do one thing is the way you do everything. 100%. The good and the bad. I'm thinking about myself right now. Cause, you, know, <laughs> you just went to a place. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, I, I, I rate myself. Like, you know, I, I'm very honest with myself. Like, I, I, I'm very self-aware. I, I know the things that I need to work on. And I also know the things that most people would see as detriments that I know work in my favor. So you have to know yourself. You have to really know yourself. And you really wouldn't get to that point unless you had those quiet moments where you're just thinking to yourself at night, uh, unobstructed, with no other person, just just you and your thoughts. You, you have to do that for you to really get a good understanding of yourself. Like, here's what I'm willing to do. Here's what I'm not willing to do. Uh, I tend to do these things. I have a temper on these topics. And just be real with yourself. Because um, not to say any of it is right or wrong, but you have to know what you're working with. You have to know the you know, the, the, the base state, like, who are you? Who are you? Most people don't even know who they are. It's kind of incredible. <laughs> they go their whole lives not even knowing who they are. It's, uh, it's actually kind of scary. That's powerful, man. I, I think we need to leave it there. And, and my hope for everyone listening to this is that you get those still quiet times at home with yourself, with your thoughts, where you can be clear on who you are and who you want to be. Byron, thank you so much for joining us, man. Uh, where you. can people find you? So all of my social media is The Real B Swag. Um, also, if I may, may I leave with one thing? Please. Whatever a win is to you, you can get those wins. You just have to start with it. You just have to get that white belt. You just have to start. You just have to walk in. You just you, you just have to start. And I want people really to, to uh, pull that away from this conversation that um, it's not impossible. It's only impossible if you think it's impossible. Thank you, man. I'm, I'm glad you found the track of life. Um, I'm glad that our paths crossed and I'm excited to see you run in the future. Appreciate that. Thank you. See you next time.